Mark chapter 3, beginning verse number 1, the Bible reads, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the Sabbath day because I just preached about it a couple Sunday nights ago, a couple Wednesday nights ago. I've already covered it a lot lately. But what I want to point out in this first part of the story is that Jesus Christ, when he's teaching in the synagogue, and he comes across this man with the withered hand, Jesus has compassion on this man. And in fact, throughout Jesus' ministry, you'll see the word compassion used over and over again when Jesus looks upon people who are suffering, who have some kind of a plague or an illness. In this case, it was a withered hand. And what you see in the Pharisees and them that looked on is a total lack of compassion for this guy. They don't care about this guy whatsoever. And that's what made Jesus so angry because it says in verse 5, when he had looked round about on them, with anger. Jesus Christ was filled with anger. Why? It says that he was grieved for the hardness of their hearts. You see, it's a hard-hearted person that would look at a person who has a withered hand and not want them to be healed and not feel bad for them, have sympathy for them, and think, boy, wouldn't it be great if that person's hand could be restored whole like as the other? But the Pharisees had no compassion they had no love for this man. All they wanted to do was find an excuse for accusing Jesus and for attacking Jesus. And what's funny is that even after they see Jesus Christ perform this great miracle of healing this man's hand, it says in verse 6 that what they immediately went out and did, what they straightway did was that they took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So even when they had looked upon this amazing miracle, they still didn't believe on him. They just wanted to go out and find a way to get him arrested, to get him in trouble. I think of in John chapter 11, when Jesus performed an even more amazing miracle, where he raised Lazarus from the dead four days after he had died. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And of course, Lazarus comes out of the grave, still bound in the grave clothes, comes stumbling out of the grave, alive, after he'd been dead for four days. And immediately when they saw that, they went out and took counsel how they could get him arrested and how they could put him to death. Not only that, they said, we don't want to just kill Jesus. We want to kill Lazarus because Lazarus is the walking proof of this miracle that was done. And he, they said, so many people are believing in Jesus. We have to do something to stop him. I mean, isn't it just bizarre that after all that, they wouldn't believe on him? Now, if you would, let's go down a little bit further in the passage. I, I want to tie this in. We'll, we'll come back to the stuff that we're skipping, but jump down, if you would, to the part on the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Back up to verse 22 where they said that. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. And of course, Beelzebub is a name for Satan. In the Old Testament, it is spelled a little differently, Baal hyphen Zebub. And Baal is the same God that the children of Israel would worship when they turned away from the Lord and they would perform human sacrifices. They were worshiping Baal, who is none other than Beelzebub. Or also Belial, where the Bible says the sons of Belial, it's the same thing. It says here that they said that he had Beelzebub and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. God said that they had blasphemed the Holy Ghost by saying that Jesus had an unclean spirit and that because of that, they would never be forgiven. Now flip over to John chapter 12, just a few pages to the right in your Bible. John chapter number 12. And while you're turning to John chapter 12, I'm going to read for you from Matthew 12, where the Bible reads, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, 
But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, a lot of people have been interested in knowing what is this unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost? Because he said, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. It's a scary thing. And so people have often wondered, you know, what is that? What does that mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Some people have even feared and said, you know, I'm afraid that I may have blasphemed the Holy Ghost in the past. But Mark chapter 3 told us very clearly what it was. It said, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So them blaspheming the Holy Ghost was when they said that Jesus was possessed with an unclean spirit. Okay. So a lot of people have wondered, is that something that it's even possible for a person to do today? Because obviously Jesus is not walking among us, performing miracles. You know, can this sin... Uh, exactly be committed in 2014. And, you know, that's kind of a, a question mark right there. But we do know this. There are definitely people today, as there have always been, who cross a line with God where there is no more forgiveness for that person. Now, a lot of people resist this doctrine and they say, nope, it's never too late for anybody. But honestly, that's just not what the Bible teaches. Even though that sounds good, hey, until they're dying, Brett, there's always hope and they can always be saved but it's just simply not true. First of all, we know that when a person dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, it's too late for them. There's no second chance after death. So that's why I find it uh, hard to understand why people struggle with this. Because it's never too late for anybody. But wait a minute, when a person dies without Christ, it's too late for them. So at some point, it's too late for every unsaved person, okay? But they say, yeah, but that's after they're dead. You know, until they're dead, they always have a chance. Well, these people didn't have a chance because the Bible said that they had blasphemed the Holy Ghost and that they would never have forgiveness for that. Now, look at John chapter 12, and, and this should shed a little bit of light on it. And this kind of ties in with what we saw in Mark chapter 3. It says in verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. So in John 12, 37, we see the same thing we saw in Mark 3, where they watch him right in their presence heal a man with a withered hand, and they still don't believe in him. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead in chapter 11 of John. They still don't believe in him. And it says in John 12, 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who had believed our report, and to whom had the arm of the Lord been revealed? Watch this. Therefore, and I want you to pay special attention to these words, they could not believe. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now, right there, the Bible's clear that they could not believe because God had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Now, where a lot of people get false doctrine from this is that they say that God just chooses certain people and just blinds them. Not because of anything that they've done, but he just blinds some people and he just damns people and he, and he saves other people just arbitrarily according to his will. And this doctrine is called Calvinism, or sometimes you'll hear it called predestination, which is a misnomer, but that's what you'll often hear it called. Now, this is not what the Bible teaches because if we go to some biblical examples, for example, we see uh, the story of Pharaoh. And in the story with Pharaoh, the Bible is really clear when it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. You know, Moses stood before him, preached the word of God unto him, and it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. But then later on in the story, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But what you have to understand is that God did not start out by hardening Pharaoh's heart. First, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then as a result of Pharaoh hardening his own heart, later God hardened his heart. Okay. But the false doctrine is where you just say, well, God just hardened Pharaoh's heart and he never had a chance. And he never had a choice. And he never could have been saved. That's a lie because the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, Amen. that Jesus Christ is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
And so it's a lie to teach that he only died for certain people. That's what Calvinism teaches. And to say that it's foreordained by God and that there's nothing any person can do to choose their own destiny, that is a lie. But on the flip side, there are people who get to a point through their own decision, through the choices of their own mind, where they get to a point where they harden their heart, where they reject the truth, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ to the point where God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And then he blinds their eyes. Then he hardens their heart and so forth. Flip over to Romans 1. But while you're turning to Romans 1, another passage that, that deals with this is in Romans chapter 11. You're turning to Romans 1. I'll, I'll read for you from Romans chapter 11, verse 7, where it says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, watch this, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back, Always. So here again, another scripture talking about God darkening their heart, blinding their eyes, and so forth. Romans 1 is probably the clearest passage on this, even though there are a lot of scriptures that teach this. Romans 1 is the clearest. It says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, First of all, I want you to know that when it says when they knew God, it's not saying that they were saved. It's just saying that they knew God. Okay. For example, let's say uh, after my wife and I had met, if someone asked her, do you know Stephen? And this, let's say before we were married, you know, we had just met and known each other, but we were not married. If someone said to her, do you know Stephen Anderson? She would say yes. But that doesn't mean that she's attached to me. That doesn't mean that we're married. Okay, that doesn't mean that there's any bond or commitment between us. Now, it's the same thing. A lot of people know God or know Jesus in the sense of that they know who he is. They're familiar with him. It doesn't mean that they're saved. It doesn't mean that they have their faith and trust in Jesus. It doesn't mean that he is their father and they are his child. Because a lot of people, they know who Jesus is. They know about Jesus, but they've not trusted Jesus as their savior. They've not uh, asked Jesus Christ to save them or called upon the name of the Lord. Just like you might know people, it doesn't mean that you trust them or believe. I mean, do you know anybody that you don't trust, that you don't believe in? Of course. So the Bible says they knew God. So it's not like these people had no exposure to who God is. They knew God. And when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So who's taking the action there? Who's the one making the choice there? They are. They knew God and they glorified him not as God. That was their first mistake. Then it says they became vain in their own imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to, uh, into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So we see them making all the wrong choices, them rejecting the true God, them believing in false gods and, and uh, doing all these things. What's the result of their rejection of the Lord? It says, wherefore, God also gave them up. Now just think about that phrase for a minute. Let that sink in. God gave them up. Now a lot of people say, well, God won't give anybody up. Well, what does the Bible say? It says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. Now these are three key words. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Does it say God just chose some people to give up to vile affections for no reason? Or it was just according to the mysteries of his will? He just made that choice before the world began and had nothing to do with the merits of the people involved. No, it says for this cause, because of what they did, because of their rejection of the Lord, he gave them up unto vile affections. Vile means disgusting. If something is vile, it means it's gross. 
And the Bible says he gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Look at this nice synopsis in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, that phrase three times is used. God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them over. Why did he give them over? Because of their choice when they knew God to not glorify him as God. And the Bible makes it clear in verse 28 that they did not even want to retain God in their knowledge. Basically, they wish that they could even just forget that there is a God. Just push God out of their mind completely. That's why these people are described in verse 30 as haters of God. Do you see that? Backbiters, haters of God. They hate God. That's why they just want to push God out of their mind. They don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. They want to worship a false God. And the Bible tells us that they become perverted as a result. They go into vile affections. Men with men, women with women. Don't be deceived, my friend. It's not a coincidence that we see this huge uh, rise in America today of all the sodomy, yeah, yeah. the homosexuality, the, the perversion, the, the queers, the sodomites, the lesbians, the, the faggots, whatever you want to call them. Nothing offends me. But let me tell you this. It's a re there's a reason why. Because as a nation, as we reject the Lord, And as the school system teaches people to worship the creature more than the creator, and when the school system teaches them to, to worship animals and to worship human beings and to reject the Lord God, and when we see a hatred for God amongst the people of America today, it shouldn't surprise you that there's also a rise of perversion at the same time in our nation. Now, the reason that I point out this scripture to you, and I, and I can show you a lot more scriptures. In fact, I do want to show you one other scripture in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, there are a lot of places we could turn, and it's really a whole sermon in and of itself. But I, I know that people have a lot of questions about this subject of, of being reprobate or, 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 or uh, being, being a person who's beyond forgiveness, you know, beyond salvation. It's, it's a subject that that uh, people are interested in hearing about and they have questions about, and so I want to deal with it a little bit here. But I want to show you one more scripture here just to, just to prove the consistency of this subject in the Bible. It says in Matthew chapter 13, in verse uh, 14, it says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And th these statements are very similar to what we've seen elsewhere, but look at the next statement. And their eyes they have closed. So who's the one closing their eyes? They close their eyes. They have closed their eyes, and the Bible says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. So we see that they closed their eyes. They rejected the truth when it was presented to them. Eventually, God hardens their heart. You say, why would God do that? Why would God harden anybody's heart? Why would God darken their eyes and, and blind them so that they cannot see? Well, think about this. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because at first he hardened his own heart. But God hardened his heart. Why? Because any sane person would have just let the children of Israel go after a couple of those plagues. I mean, any person with a brain in their head, and I'm sure Pharaoh was a very intelligent man, would have just seen the plagues and the destruction and just realized this isn't worth it. Let these people go. Get these people out of here. But God wanted to destroy Pharaoh. And God wanted to punish Pharaoh and his armies. God wanted to be glorified by demolishing Egypt and the armies and the king. And, and he wanted to bring his judgment. It reminds me also of 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 3, where we have the sons of Eli. And the two sons of Eli... Uh, Eli takes them aside and tries to correct them because they were fornicators, they were gluttons, they were wicked men, they were sons of Belial, the Bible says, which, you know, again, they're reprobate. And, and Eli tries to talk to them and warn them and rebuke them, and the Bible says that they would not hearken to the voice of Eli because the Lord would destroy them. Okay, so God gets to a point with people that are unsaved and they keep rejecting the truth, 
he, he gets to a point with them where he's fed up with them and he wants to destroy them. Now, obviously, we know God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But when a person crosses a certain line, you know, God gets fed up with them and he decides you're done. Game over. You're done. Now, for some people, that's death. He'll bring death. But other times they'll still live, but he'll harden their heart. Remember Nabal, his heart became as a stone. And we see here in the story with Pharaoh that God did not want Pharaoh to let the people go on the sixth plague or the seventh plague. He didn't want to let them off that easy. And any normal person would have let it go. At that point, all of his advisors are coming to him and saying, what are you doing? Don't you know, Pharaoh, that all of Egypt is destroyed? What are you doing? But yet he just stupidly, and, and just the point of ridiculousness, holds out until the 10th plague is done. And then even after he lets them go, he gets all the army together and goes and chases after them. Why? Because God wanted to drown them all in the Red Sea. And so that's what happened. So God gets to a point where he decides that a person is just marked for judgment. It's too late for them. You know, they've rejected the truth too many times. They're too wicked. And God decides to turn them over to a reprobate mind. He'll darken their heart. He'll blind their eyes and he'll destroy them. But don't let people twist these verses to you that God's just doing that to people at random or they just pick certain people to do that. No, that's not true. It's our actions that determine our destiny and it's our faith in Jesus Christ that determines our salvation or our damnation. The Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a choice that the individual makes. God said, I've said before you this day, life and death, blessing, he said, choose life. You know, we have that free will to choose salvation or rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, people get to a point, though, where they've made the wrong choice too many times and they cross that line. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. How can a person know if they've crossed that line? Well, I think some of the keys that we saw in the scriptures that we just looked at was, first of all, in John chapter 12, it said they could not believe. Because a lot of people are saying, you know, are you saying that if one of these people believes on Christ, they won't be saved? No, because anyone who believes on Christ will be saved. Amen. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ shall be saved. But remember, John 12 said they could not believe. So it's not that he won't save them if they'll call upon him. It's that they, they can't believe. They're past the point where they can believe. Not only that, but it says they could not believe, but it also says that they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge and that they were haters of God. So some people have come to me uh, concerned and said, you know, man, I'm afraid, you know, I, I, one time I said this really blasphemous thing and I'm afraid that I might have blasphemed the Holy Ghost or, you know, I'm afraid I might have crossed the line in this other area or whatever. You know, I'm just afraid that I could be reprobate. And I always just show that person these scriptures and say, wait a minute, do you believe on Jesus? Then you're saved because those that are not saved, they don't believe in Jesus. And then I always ask them this too, you know, do you, do you not want to retain God in, the, in your knowledge? They say, you know, no, I love God. I love the Bible. Then that's proof that you're not a reprobate because the reprobate doesn't want to retain God in his knowledge. He doesn't want anything to do with God. He doesn't believe in Jesus. You know, people like, uh, you know, when you see a guy like uh, Judas Iscariot, for example, you know, Judas Iscariot, the Bible says he was a devil from the beginning and that he did not believe in Jesus. Even at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he talks about the fact that Judas Iscariot did not believe in him. But you'll notice that Judas, throughout Jesus' ministry, there are times when, when Judas will get angry and, and hateful toward Jesus in his heart. You know, he'll see something that Jesus does or that some of the disciples where they put the ointment on his head and Jesus defends it and Judas gets angry and, and, and hateful and everything like that. And he was also uh, possessed with, with the devil also. But it, it, it's pretty clear when you read the scripture that those who are reprobate, those who've been blinded, you know, they, they don't love the Lord. I mean, they hate the Lord in their heart. They, they, they can't believe. They're haters of God and so on and so forth. You say, what causes a person to cross that line? Well, biblically, you know, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And we saw what that was. That was where they said that Jesus had an unclean spirit. Another thing that can drag a person across this line is according to Revelation 22, anyone that adds to God's word or removes from God's word. Because the Bible says if you take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away your part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. Some people will try to twist that, that you can lose your salvation. But of course, you can never lose your salvation. That's an unsaved person that would do that. 
and basically their part is removed from the book of life. The place where their name would have been is removed, and basically they have no chance to be saved in the future. Someone who would add to the scripture or take away from the scripture loses the opportunity to be saved. Just like the person who blasphemes the Holy Ghost loses the opportunity to be saved. Another example of this is in Revelation. If a person receives the mark of the beast, you know, if they're living in that end time, where the mark of the beast is given in the, in the forehead or in the right hand. It says if anybody receives that mark, they're going to be damned. They're going to the lake of fire. So that's another way that people can just seal their fate and become a reprobate and, and become uh, beyond salvation. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost, receiving the mark of the beast. Um, uh, what was the other one that I mentioned? Blaspheming the Holy Ghost, receiving the mark of the beast, and tampering with God's word. And then also, you, I, I believe that if you study scripture, People who just keep rejecting Christ, keep rejecting Christ, just keep hardening their heart, closing their eyes to the truth, you know, there comes a time where they cross that line. Now, we don't know, we're not going to know when other people have crossed. We know that we haven't crossed that line. First of all, we know, that, we know that we're saved. I mean, the vast majority of people in this room tonight, you know, are saved. Thank God. Ninety-some percent of the people here are saved. And we know we're saved because the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We know that we're saved because we believed in Jesus as our Savior. That's how we know we're saved. And the Bible says, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we know we're saved. And when it comes to unsaved people, we don't always know if, if they're reprobate or not. Now, let me say this. The vast majority of people are, of course, not reprobate. The vast majority of unsaved people have the potential to become saved. And that's why we should go out and give them the gospel. And when in doubt, just give people the gospel. You know, just give the gospel to everybody. But there are some people where you can look at that person and say, okay, this person's a reprobate. You know, and I believe that when you see people who are just a full-blown homosexual, men lusting after other men, women lusting after other women, and when they fit that bill of Romans chapter 1, I mean, I think they might as well be wearing a sign on them that says, I've been given over to a reprobate mind. Because that's just not a normal desire for any man or woman to have. And the Bible tells in Romans 1 where that desire comes from. It comes from being given over to vile affections. To do those things that are not convenient. The word convenient there means to come naturally. You know, to, to be turned over to things that wouldn't come naturally. You know, we're all tempted to sin, aren't we? Every day we have to fight the flesh, don't we? And we're tempted to sin. But you know what? That's not a sin that tempts normal people. It's not even on their radar. I mean, men aren't having to say, you know what, I'm just going to have to just be straight because it's the right thing to do. No, you're just straight. And you know what? Y you have no attraction to some dude. You are attracted to women, period. Now, look, is there a temptation to lust after women? Yes. Is there a temptation to commit fornication or adultery as a man? Yes, there is. But there's no temptation toward other men. It's, in fact, it's repulsive. It's something that you would just, ugh, get it away from me. And you know, I'm sick and tired of, a, of a, a Christianity that panders to the homosexuals of today. I'm sick of it. I'm so sick of this soft, watered down, handling this issue with kid gloves. They're filthy, they're vile, they're perverted, they're disgusting. The Bible said they shall be put to death. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. They're, they're vile. He said that they're going after strange flesh and he said that they are filthy in second peter chapter 2 and i'm not going to sit here and try to please everybody and i was told in bible college they said this well you got to be careful though because everybody has a relative that is one now and they said if you get up and thunder forth toward homosexuality you're going to offend the people because everybody has a relative that is one. i don't care if it's your siamese twin Okay, it's filthy, it's disgusting. Okay, I don't care if that offends you. It's the truth, it's Bible. And you're not going to hear this anywhere else. Somebody's got to get up and preach the Bible to you. Yeah. You're not going to see it on TV. You're not going to hear it on the radio. You're not going to get it in school. Where are you going to get it if you're not going to get it in church? But today, Christians think, oh, if we just go soft on the world, they'll accept our message. Yeah, how's that been working for you the last 50 years? 
For the last 50 years, Christianity has softened up and lightened up and we've become cool, and we're hip with the kids, and we're trendy, and you know, the preacher puts on a pair of blue jeans with a bunch of holes in it, greases his hair back, puts on a necklace, you know, take off the tie, loosen up some buttons, you know, and he's just cool. <laughs> and he just tells you, listen, bro, it's not a religion. Get this stupid tie off. I need to get free of this legalism, bro. <laughs> need to get free, bro. Because let me tell you something. It's a relationship. It's all about, the, it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship with the, with the Lord, you know. But you know what? Let me tell you something. They've been trying that for the last 50 years, and you know what it, it has caused? Just a generation of young people that live like the devil. That's all it costs. When you get rid of the hard preaching, whatever you tolerate in the church is going to be there. When you sit there and go soft on sin and you don't preach hard anymore, then you know what happens? Everybody just goes out and just commits all the sin because they're not being warned. Look, what kept me on the right path as a teenager? Hard preaching. I'll tell you what, I didn't fornicate as a teenager for one reason and one reason alone because I was scared to death of the wrath of God. And I'm not talking about going to hell. I mean, I knew I was saved. I knew I was going to heaven. I knew that that had nothing to do with works. And I knew that I could never lose my salvation. But let me tell you something. I was scared of God punishing me and chastening me because the Bible talks about him scourging his sons that are disobedient. And I didn't want to ruin my life. And I knew that God would come down hard on me. And you know what put that idea into my head? Leather long, fire-breathing, independent, fundamental Baptist preaching is what did it. I didn't get it at the liberal, new evangelical, NIV preaching, rock and roll church where there's no soul winning, nobody's getting baptized, and it's all just a fun center and a playhouse. We need hard preaching today, and we need to take a stand. You don't get anywhere by pandering to these people. Look, they're haters of God. But you think, oh, if we just be nice to them, then, you know, just be nice to them, then they're going to, they're going to, you know, feel the love of Christ. It's not happening. No, we need to stand up against them because they're taking over America. They're not reproducers, they're recruiters. And let me tell you something, the schools have been taken over. The government has been taken over. And Hollywood, you know, was all, I don't know if it's really been taken over, if it was just always a den of iniquity. But I'm telling you, we need to stand up and cry aloud and spare not because the majority of people in this country agree with what I'm saying right now if I say that homosexuality is perversion. The majority of people agree with me. But they're all just scared and hiding. And therefore, they just take over everything. And it's just all filth and perversion everywhere we turn. It's, it's disgusting, it's reprobate, but that's not what the sermon's about. Let's go to Mark chapter 3, uh, and let's finish this thing, all right? It's easy to, to get off on that. I just get tired of it, you know? I mean, this, this new evangelical movement of the last 50 years, it's been a failed experiment, is what it's been. Oh, man, if we just bring in, you know, worldly methods, we're going to reach more people. No, they don't. You know who's reaching the most people for Christ in Phoenix, Arizona? Faithful Word Baptist Church. That's, I mean, if you want to know who's getting the most people saved, okay, I'm not saying we have the biggest attendance. I'm saying who's going out and opening the Bible and giving the gospel to more people in a given week or in a given month or in a given year in Phoenix, Arizona. It's Faithful Word Baptist Church. And why? We're not soft. We're not compromising. Okay, the real answer is not to compromise, them. it's to go out and knock doors like we have scores of people doing and to bring the gospel and to bring the truth and to bring the word of God. And this, this new evangelical movement, you know, that's who we go around and give the gospel to all day and get them saved because they're not saved, most of them. I mean, we knock on the doors of, of people all the time that go to these big community fun center, you know, mega churches. And, and the vast majority of them, when you ask them if they know for sure if they die today, they go to heaven say, oh, I hope so, I'm a good person. That's not the gospel. I hope so, because I'm living a pretty good life, or, well, I think so. Can you, you know, oh, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. Oh, but can you lose your salvation? Oh, of course you can lose your salvation if you don't live right. They don't know the gospel. 
Salvation is eternal. It's through faith alone, by grace alone, not, alone, not of works the same man should boast. But we go around getting all their church members saved all the time because they don't get their church members saved because they don't teach any doctrine. They're too busy pandering to a bunch of faggots and weirdos, and they're too busy softening up and watering down the message, and they're too busy trying to create a fun atmosphere for the youth, and, every, you know, and, and, and they're too busy running their little coffee shop and their little... Look, we need the Word of God to be preached. That's all we need. But anyway, let's get to Mark chapter 3. Jesus was grieved with the hardness of their hearts. And we talked about why their hearts were hardened. We saw a little bit later in the chapter that they blasphemed the Holy Ghost, right? That's why they had such a hard heart. What does it mean to have a hard heart? To have no compassion on the lost. And you know what proves your compassion for the lost? When you go out and give the gospel to the lost. I mean, if you love people and you want them to go to heaven, you're going to get out there and knock the doors and, and preach the gospel. You're going to open your Bible to your co- I mean, if you really love your co-workers and family and friends, you're going to open your Bible and show them how to be saved. That's the most loving thing that you could do. Bring them the good news, the gospel's good news today, that Jesus paid it all and that salvation is by faith alone. That's what it means to have compassion on the lost. We don't have the healing powers of Jesus and the apostles to be able to, you know, go find every person who has a withered hand and heal them. It would be a blessing if we could, but we don't. But let me tell you this, we have the power of the gospel and we can get people saved. And actually, someone being saved is actually greater than their hand being healed. It's even more important. And so we need to have compassion and not be hard-hearted, callous, where we see the suffering of people around us and we don't care. Now, this could apply to salvation. We see the lost, we don't care. But also just people's physical suffering. We, a lot of people have become very callous today. Maybe part of it's due to movies, video games, where violence doesn't bother them anymore. And they become very callous to human suffering. Like, for example, people um, who, who cheer on warfare. Right? And they, they cheer on basically just bombing civilians. They cheer on. And I'm not saying that's what's going on this week because I, I honestly don't even know what's going on. This Isn't somebody being bombed this week? I don't know who's being bombed. I haven't been, I, 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 you know, I've been paying attention to this kind of stuff right here, but you know, I haven't really been paying attention to the news. I know someone's being bombed. I don't know who it is, but I know that historically we bombed a lot of civilians. You know, I, and honestly, I don't believe in it and I never will. In the Bible, it's clear that warfare is to be fought between men on a battlefield and that just bombing innocent civilians is not right. You can call it whatever you want, call it oh, a little collateral damage. No, when you're bombing and killing hundreds of thousands of civilians, that's not excusable. It's just not right. You say, well, we had to do it. No, you don't. You don't have to do anything. If you do what's right, God will bless you. If you do that which is wrong, God will curse you. So you can't say, well, we're just so scared for our safety. We're just so scared over here that we're going we're gonna to kill some women and children just to make sure we're safe. No, safety is of the Lord. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You know, I'm not going to go into a big, long history lesson, but there are times when we basically have slaughtered civilians. And I'm not saying we're the only ones who've done it. I mean, it's just, it's something that all nations are doing now. It's, it's something that, that has just become the warfare of the 20th and 21st century, just to slaughter civilians. And they say, well, you know, it's just a new kind of warfare. Well, it's a sinful kind of warfare. It's a kind of warfare that we shouldn't have anything to do with. You know, for example, and, and this might offend people, but it doesn't matter. It's the truth. You know, dropping nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and just wiping out children, women, pregnant women, men, you know, just innocent people was wrong. Amen. You know, not only that, but the bombing of Dresden, Germany in 1945 was wrong. When they firebombed Dresden and killed like a hundred and some thousand Innocent people in a city where there were no military installations, no armaments were being produced there. It had no strategic significance at all. It was just terrorism. It was just, let's just burn an entire city to the ground and kill every man, woman, boy, and girl just to scare our enemies. In February of 1945, when we're already winning. You know, it isn't right, okay? And regardless of your political views, that's not the point. The point is, it's not right 
to kill innocent people. But a lot of times people are just so calloused and so hard-hearted that they might hear about uh, children, innocent uh, uh, civilians being killed, and they just don't care. Damn! I mean, I've, I've heard some people just talk about, we should just nuke Iran. Just nuke it. Just nuke it off the map. What are you talking about? What kind of a sick uh, teaching is that? To just say, oh yeah, just nuke it off the map. Just destroy it. And then I've heard some people justify it by saying, well, you know, it's their fault because they, you know, they elected that government or whatever. So it's their fault. Nuke them all. Kill, wipe them all out. Or, well, they're Muslim. Well, f first of all, number one, they're not all Muslim. There are Christians over there as well, or people that are just non-religious. But even if they are Muslim, that doesn't mean that they can't be saved. They, I've won some Muslims to the Lord on soul winning. You know, I hope to win more Muslims to the Lord. You know, b just because somebody is another religion, whether that be Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, Buddhist, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't love them and give them gospel, not just wipe them out. Just kill them all and let God sort them out. Wrong. We should not have this attitude. But I've heard Christians talk that way. They just say, hey, just, just nuke Iran. Just, just, just bomb them. Just bomb Iran. Just bomb them into the Stone Age and these type of things. But what about all the innocent people over there? And you know what? Uh, they elected the, okay, well, hold on a second. Do you want to be responsible for everything our government does? I mean, what if our government goes out and does all this wicked stuff, and then somebody says, well, you deserve to be bombed because you elected those people. I didn't elect, I don't even vote. So how did I elect them? Yeah, but you let it happen. Did, do I really have the potential, me personally, to stop what's going on in our country of 350 million people? I'm just going to turn this government around single-handedly, folks. <laughs> Steven Anderson for president. It's just not, it's not happening. It's actually, Steven Anderson for dictator. President's not, I need, I need all the power, all right, to, in order to fix things, all right? <laughs> it's only temporary. But I, I'm just saying, you know, you can't sit there and just hard-hearted and, and just cheer. And, and Christians today, listen to me now, Christians have become the biggest cheerleaders for war. And it's not a New Testament teaching. And they'll t try to take you, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They'll try to take you to an Old Testament passage where Israel was told to wipe out a specific group of people and say, see, that's like what we're doing over there. No, you're not Israel and you're not wiping out the Hittites, okay? You need to, welcome to the New Testament. Blessed are the peacemakers, okay? And we should be for peace. And look, I'm all for self-defense. I'm not a pacifist. If someone comes to my house, I will not even think twice about putting so many holes in them with my shotgun that there's going to be more hole than person when I'm done, okay? I've got my shotgun loaded to the hill with buckshot. I got a few slugs on the, on the side of the stock just in case, you know, for a strategic uh, uh, reload. I've got extra buckshot right there. I'm ready, and I wouldn't even think about it. If somebody comes in to hurt my family, if somebody comes in and my family's in danger, I'm going to blow them away. Okay, and it's, and it, but, but look, I'm not a pacifist. And look, if someone's actually invading our country, and I'm not talking about some island that we control thousands of miles away, that's, you know, that's our soil. I'm talking about if somebody actually invades our country, then we should defend it. I'm all for fighting a defensive war, but that's not what's going on. That, ha that hadn't happened in a, uh, in a long time. When was the last time that happened? 1812 or something? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm sure it's happened since then. When do you think it happened? Did they really? In World War II in California. Okay, well, there you go. But we were, of course, we were already fighting them at that point, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with fighting a defensive war or defending your house. But, you know, what if I, think about this. What if I came out of my house with my shotgun and said, you know, there are a lot of people in this neighborhood that are a threat. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, these people, I mean, look at them. First of all, they're armed. They're criminals. They've, they've said threatening things to me, you know, and I'm just going to go ahead and just, I'm just going to proactively go take them out. But in fact, that would make more sense because that's actually in my neighborhood. But what if I said, in fact, I've heard about a really bad criminal element in, in Los Angeles, California. 
and I'm afraid that they might one day travel to Phoenix and invade my home. So I'm going to get some, you know, get a coalition together. We're going to go to L.A. We're going to hunt and kill every derelict gang member in East L.A. You know, just and either you're with us or you're, or you're with them. You know, let's go kill them first. Let's kill, kill or be killed. Kill them before they get to us. It's stupid, friend. But you know what? You've got your head so far in, Christ, or in conservative talk radio. That's where you're getting these weird ideas from. We got to fight these people. We got to defend them. You know, we are. No, we don't. We need to defend ourselves and not go get involved in warfare on the other side of the world. You say, oh, but they, they killed Americans who were over there messing with them. They didn't come here and kill Americans. Okay? So this idea of, oh, yeah, we got to go bomb them because, look, I'm against it and I'm deaf. And, and, and any war that we fight, should be a defensive war and we should fight against soldiers and troops and, and, and uh, you know, we could fight against the supply lines. We should not be just bombing women and children Amen. and just killing civilians. It isn't right, okay? And you say, well, but they're using them as human cover. Well, you know what? So what? Maybe the Lord would just bless us if we do what's right. But you know what? Our country doesn't do what's right in so many areas. They know that God's not going to bless them anyway. That's why they just do whatever when it comes to the battlefield. And I, I just have to bring that up just because of how hard-hearted people are, where, they're, where they cheer for war. You know, even if there was a war that actually needs to be fought, it should grieve us when people die, whether the people are on our side or the other side. When young soldiers and innocent men, women, and children die, it should grieve us. We should have sympathy and sorrow and not just be so callous because we've been playing some video game where we blow people apart all day that it just means nothing to us anymore. And you know what, that, this kind of preaching offends people and steps on people's toes, but you need to hear it though. Because there's a lot of just propaganda out there to try to get you all fired up to go to war and to go kill everybody and go fight everybody. And we need to, as Christians, stop and let the Bible be our guide and, and think about this and have some more compassion on people. But anyway, let me, let me blast through the rest of this chapter, the things I haven't covered yet. Of course, we have the... Uh, story about Jesus Christ. Uh, it says in verse 7, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan and they about Tyre and Zidon. A great multitude when they had heard what great things he did came unto him and he spake unto his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude lest they should throng him. So again, we just have huge crowds following Jesus. It says, for he had healed many in so much that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And of course, this is kind of a mystery, but Jesus just didn't want people to know at this point yet that he was the Son of God or that he was the Messiah, or that he was the Christ. Because if you remember, uh, there were all th times throughout where you know, people say, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he, he charges them not to make it known yet. Because his time was not yet come, his hour was not yet come. He had a certain purpose for how he wanted his ministry to play out, and at what point he would be arrested, and he didn't want things to happen prematurely. He also didn't want the people to take him by force and make him a king. Because a lot of the Jews at that time were expecting the Messiah to be one who would come and bring political deliverance. That would be a warrior that would fight against Rome and, and free them from Roman oppression and, and build a great kingdom of Israel like it was in the days of David and Solomon. And so they were afraid, Jesus was afraid many times that they would take him and make him a king by force. And he was constantly trying to escape from that. So I think that's why he, he told them not to make him known. Of course, the devils knew who he was. They're saying, you're the son of God, because, you know, of course, the devils believe and they fear and tremble, the Bible says. But the Bible uh, talks about after that, in verse 13, he goeth up into a mountain, calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. So these are the apostles. They're given special power to perform miracles to heal sicknesses, and they're also commissioned to preach the gospel. He lists the names of the apostles. We already read them earlier. Then it says in verse 20, And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, He's beside himself. Now, what does it mean to be beside yourself? Does anybody know? 
crazy. Yeah, when you're beside yourself, it means you're crazy. So what happened was Jesus' fame went into all countries of how he's doing all this healing. So every sick person in the whole region is trying to get there to be healed by Jesus. And they're thronging him, and he can't even get a break even to eat a meal. And he just keeps healing. He just keeps preaching. So Jesus is really pushing himself to the limit of how much preaching he can do, how much healing he can do. And his friends are going to basically do an intervention here. You know, they want to take hold on him and get him out of there. And they said, he's nuts. He's beside himself. They, they just can't believe that he's just going to keep preaching, keep healing. You know, they're like, he needs a break. He needs to have something to eat. Just shows the intensity of Jesus' ministry, just how hard he was working. And, uh, and just how much... Uh, he really pushed himself to do the most that he could while he was on this earth. And then, of course, we have the part about the, uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, which we already talked about. But let me just focus in on verse 27 in Jesus' parable about Satan not being able to cast out Satan. He says in verse 27, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. So that's a great parable, saying that if somebody wants to come in and rob a strong man's house, the first thing they have to do is bind the strong man. Then they'll spoil his house, okay? Because if the strong man is unfettered, he's going to defend his property. He's going to kill him. He's going to hurt him. He's going to fight them up. But if you think about this, in the day that we live, in today's world, of course, we have homes that are led by men, the father, the husband, the head of household. And if you think about it, the devil wants to attack the family. He wants to destroy the family. He doesn't want to spoil the physical house of physical goods. The devil doesn't care about material possessions or money or wealth. He wants the people. Remember Genesis 14, when, when the king of Sodom, who represents Satan, came to Abraham and said, Abraham, you take all the goods for yourself. Give me the persons. And that's what the devil wants. He wants your soul. He wants the souls of your children. He wants the souls of mankind. He's not interested in material wealth. And so the devil wants to spoil our houses, not our physical house of, of you know, a building of wood and plaster, but actually our homes. He wants to destroy our homes. He wants to get in and destroy the home. And in order for the devil to spoil our houses, he has to first bind the strong man. You see, the husband or the father of the home should be the strongest leader in that home and should be the first line of defense in that home. You know, in the middle of the night, if something happens, dad should be there to protect. Dad, should, you know, I'm a very deep sleeper, so my wife will probably have already killed everybody by the time I wake up. But honestly, you know, she won't even, you know, think, to, she won't even bother waking me up. She'll just tell me about it the next morning. But hey, I'm just kidding. But anyway... If you think about it, you know, it's, it's the man of the house that, you know, when there's a noise outside, you know, that goes and investigates. You know, he's the one that's the greatest threat to the enemy. He's the strongest force in that house, the strongest defense, the bulwark against the enemy. And in order for the devil to destroy families, he has to bind the strong man first. You know, the husband or the father has to be taken out of the equation, first of all. And that's why there's an attack on men in the home today. By, what does it mean to bind the strong man? What does it mean to be bound? Tied up, right? Tied up. Basically, tying the hands of fathers and husbands today. Tying their hands. What do you mean tying their hands? Making them incapable to rule their house so that he can come in and, and make the rules. And what I'm talking about today is that, you know, the world that we live in would love to make it illegal to spank your children. And not only just would they love to make it illegal to spank your children. And by the way, you have to discipline your children or they're going to be monsters. You say, how do you handle eight children? You know, when I go out in public with my eight children, people are like, I can't even handle the one that I have. Or I can't even handle the two that I have. How do you deal with eight? But here's the thing. If you actually deal with them, if you actually teach them and train them and raise them and spend time with them and discipline them, it's manageable. But the way some people deal with their kids, no wonder they only have one. No wonder they only have two. They, there's no way they could have more than that. They would outnumber them and lynch their own parents. You know, So that's why they only have one or two, just something that they can contain. Because they don't train the children. But men's hands are tied today. But not even just tied in that way, but also just 
uh, spiritually and just mentally, man's hands are being tied where men are being told, hey, you can't lead. You can't, you can't uh, tell your wife what to do. You know, she's her own woman and feminism and I'm woman, hear me roar and all this stuff of, you know, uh, equal equality. And, and look, men and women are equal of value in the sight of God. But let me tell you something, there's, there's not equal authority. There's not equal roles. Men and women have different roles. And the Bible says that the husband's the head of the wife, the wives are to obey their husbands. But today, men's hands are being tied and they're saying, you can't rule, you can't lead. You know, and, and, and then they say, oh, you know, you have to let your children do whatever they want. Let, you have to let, I mean, I heard about some guy getting in trouble because he wouldn't let his daughter go to the prom. Yeah. 